So on to John. John Gus Leonard was born in Lewiston, Montana in 1957. And after high school, he joined the Navy. And I guess the deal was they subsequently paid for John to get his, his undergraduate degree. So he got a BS in chemistry from the University of Montana at Missoula. He then went on to receive a PhD in physical chemistry from the University of Oregon in Eugene, where he worked on nonlinear dynamics. Then he spent many years working on a family farm on the Judith River, raising cattle and wheat. Then he had a choice to make uh, between continuing on in the, in the farming and ranching business or joining his wife, Diane, in the coffee business in Jackson Hole. <laughs> so he decided to, to join the coffee business and he did that in 1998. So since then, John and Diane have owned Great Northern Coffee. And if you've never had any, you should try it because it's a really good. <laughs> um, they have two boys, 20, now 21 and 22. And John is going to talk to us about crystals and light. And I have to admit, um, mineralogy was one of my least favorite subjects in, 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 in graduate school. So I'm really looking forward to John making me um, re rekindling, kindling my interest in, in this subject with some beautiful pictures. So thank you, John, and take it away. All right, thank you, Cynthia. All right, so <clears throat> this image right here came from a recent journal in 2011. It shows uh, an outcrop over by Thermopolis. And this part here is a thin section, which I'll get to explain. But one of the dramatic things that's happened in the last 20 years or so is these high resolution digital images could be made available for all of us to see. Uh, this idea, this thin sectioning is at least a couple hundred years old, but it's only recently that any of us could see it. You would have to go to a geology lab to look at it. There was no other way. <clears throat> so as I've been looking at these last few years, there's a, a puzzle arose. This is all quartz grains in here with a, just a couple of exceptions. It's a sandstone right here, the Morrison. It's where dinosaur fossils are often found. And these people right here took about a hundred thin sections to try to understand the environment. <clears throat> but these are all quartz grains, but one is white. Here's a gray green one. Here's a black one. So what is going on there? They have the same light going through them. And if you can imagine rotating the stage of the microscope so that this image would rotate, one of these white ones would turn black and one of the black ones would turn white. Um, I had no idea what was going on there. Um, only clue I had was they said cross-polarized light. So when I went to look up cross-polarized light, I got in deeper and I realized I had to start at the beginning. So we're gonna do reflection, then refraction, look at what polarized light is, and then cross-polarized light. So here's the kind of thing that I, uh, let's, next slide. Oops. Okay, this is the kind of thing I found when I started searching what's cross-polarized light on a thin section. So it's even worse than the quartz one. Here, they're all different colors. And again, I have no idea why. It's green horn blend, all right? So the little XPL there, that's cross-polarized light. PPL stands for plain polarized light. So it's common to do both. So they change the kind of light, whatever that is, and you get a dramatically different image. Okay, here's the, the another example of why this might be useful. These people over here, we're looking for um, rare earth deposits in Africa. So they're getting lots of rocks, taking the thin sections to see if they can get information uh, for economic purposes. <clears throat> this is the original plain polarized light slides. You can see they all look the same. 
But it, when they do the cross-polarized light, it, it uh, dramatically gives more information, not just higher resolution, but it's allowing people to identify all these different things in here. Not just the minerals, but what's in between the mineral. The experts care as much about that as they do about the mineral. So, so at this point, I'm convinced that this is interesting and I still have no idea how it works. Okay, so starting with reflection. So this is a light pillar. You can see these on a very cold night. Uh, for example, in the parking lot in the grocery stores where I've seen them. When it's well below zero, the air is very still. So the crystals, ice crystals don't move around a lot and they kind of drift down like leaves. And so this is a professional photographer here that lives in Pinedale. David Bell, and he took this image of Pinedale. He went up on a hill outside of town, and the different colors are just from the different color of the source of the light. Like a fluorescent light on the main street there might be orange or red, you know, the bars, the restaurants, that kind of thing. So <clears throat> Les Cowley, who's a retired scientist in England, gave a nice explanation for this as these crystals of ice are floating down in the air, they reflect the light from that source. And it arrives in your eye and your eye can't see these crystals. So it interprets that the light came from up here. And so you, your brain interprets as a pillar. There actually isn't a pillar of light out there. That's just how your brain is interpreting the information it's getting. The light is all right down here or the source of the light. So that's reflection. Now refraction. So refraction to remind you is when light goes into a substance where the speed of light is different, it will bend like this. This one's not very interesting, but here's some interesting examples. This one <clears throat> I've seen several times. I haven't seen this one, but the moon is a lot safer to look at. So that's probably why I've seen it. This is a halo. It's called a 22 degree halo. And 22 degrees is roughly, if you outstretch your arm, the distance between your thumb and your little finger would be 22 degrees. It's useful to do that because there's other structures that could be seen that are small. You'll know it's a halo if it's that size. Here's a halo around the sun. And, and I should point out that the people who took these photos, they're showing some skill. When I try to take a photo of a moon halo, all I get is a bunch of bright light from the moon. So there's, there's some skill involved in doing that. This line right here is probably a caustic inside the lenses of the camera. It's not, it's not out in atmosphere. <clears throat> so to understand what's causing those halos, look at the crystals in the atmosphere. And Walter Tape, he was a scientist down in Antarctica, which is a good place to research ice crystals. He took this photo. <clears throat> so they're hexagonal plates and columns. So there's more than one kind of ice crystal up in the atmosphere. And what's going on when the moon or the sunlight hits these ice crystals, you can see it, if, if it hits the crystal oriented this way, refracts, this one gives 29 degrees. So now rotate the crystal a little more, you get 22 degrees. This one, it's about 30, and then you just start over again. So the range is very small, and they, they tend to average about 22 degrees. So all those reflected rays, there's a concentration right here at 22 degrees. And it's slightly darker on the interior because the light there is some of that light is being refracted away from us. So crystals with the large face flat because these crystals up here are oriented in all directions, but if they're flat horizontal, then you get a little enhancement right here and a little color separation. Because remember different colors of light have different refractive indexes or they have different velocities in the ice crystal. This came courtesy of the Jackson Old News and Guy. Okay, so 
what are the different ways that light could interact with a mineral crystal, not just ice in the air? So one of the, <clears throat> one of the early successes for geology was being able to use nanometer wavelength light. This is commonly called x-rays, but I just I want to emphasize that it's light. If you shoot this kind of light at a crystal, you'll get a diffraction or an interference pattern. And that's how people learned what minerals were, what is their structure, that kind of thing. In a modern geology lab, a lot of the people would use powder diffraction, they'd grind up the sample and get a curve kind of looks like this that would tell them what the mineral is. You don't see that, that much, at least in the articles I read anymore. They'll just say they did it, but there's no pictures because it's not really giving that much new. It just helps them identify what's in their sample. If you use micrometer wavelength light, then you can get all these interesting birefringent refraction effects in a thin crystal, which we're going to get into. We're not gonna do this one because it would take a whole nother hour to do that. We're just gonna focus on this. This is the most common image I see in a journal article outside of the rock outcrop. So typically you'll see a rock outcrop and then a thin section. If you used broader wavelength light, 10 micrometers, then that would be infrared. And you occasionally see people do infrared, but it's not nearly as interesting as this. So this is all we're gonna focus on is this one. Micrometer, 10 to the minus six meters. Okay. So before we get into it, I wanna explain a little bit about what the index of refraction is. It's the speed of light in a vacuum divided by the speed of light in the glass or water, whatever you're looking at. So it's usually a number around one and a half to three. Light gets slowed down quite a bit in media. And one way to think about how people model this, try to do a quantitative calculation. This is an image of an ocean wave hitting a energy extraction device. This thing is kind of coupled by spring to this. As the wave makes it move up and down, it could extract energy from the wave and convert it into electricity. That's the theory anyway. But when a wave hits, say a piece of quartz, the electrons in the quartz are moved by the light wave. They oscillate. And just as you can imagine this buoy bouncing up and down and making its own waves, the electrons inside a quartz crystal will make their own waves when they oscillate. And all those waves will combine to create the appearance that the speed of light in the mineral is lower than in the vacuum. Uh, one general point I wanna make about this is using water to understand fields is something that's helped me a lot. There's a lot of other things you can do uh, it's not just a hand-waving thing. If you were to get Maxwell's equations out and really look at index of refraction, you'd use a model exactly like this, and it'd be called a harmonic oscillator. All right, types of polarization of the waves. An ocean wave, like the one hitting that buoy, it only oscillates in a vertical direction. It's a transverse wave. It only has one polarization, vertical. Other waves can have different kinds of polarization. A, a light wave can have two kinds of transverse waves. It could oscillate this way, or it could oscillate out of the plane. So two transverse waves. Light waves don't have longitudinal waves, but waves in an earthquake could. And the way I learned this is with a slinky. So this is the picture I'm showing. You can have a wave in a slinky where the compression goes in this direction. So you can see the density is a little higher here, lower here. So you could call this a density wave too. Where over on this wave, the density is the same along this slinky, but it's oscillating in and out of the line. All right. <clears throat> Some people would call this a scalar wave and this one a vector wave. And you can also have quadrupole waves that are called tensors, lots of different kinds of polarizations out there. It, for electric light though, we only need these two transverse polarizations. 
And to do experiments, we wanna select one of those polarizations. Here's an example of how to do that with a mechanical wave. So this physicist right here, he made an experiment where he put a rubber string between an anchor here and a motor, which would rotate it. So it's going in a circle here. You could say it's a circularly polarized wave. And then he compressed that wave between two metal bars. So they squeeze it and he gets this horizontal polarization right here, a linear polarization. If he put the bars perpendicular, he would have got a polarization like this. That's mechanical. Electrical, one way to do it is use a wired grid. So here's the incident waves from, from a light bulb. And I'll give you an example of this later. So as they hit this wired grid, waves that oscillate vertically will move electrons in those wires and they will be absorbed as heat. They won't get through. The horizontal ones can't move the electrons, they get through. So it, this can be tricky and this is actually shown incorrectly a couple of times on the internet. The waves don't sneak through the bar here, all right? It's not like this one, it's the opposite. The waves that are parallel to this grid, they don't make it, they have to be this way. Now, the interesting thing about minerals is they're polymers. They're not symmetric, like a single chain, a double chain, or a sheet. And so they can act like that wire grid polarizer. So the electrons will more readily move in one direction than in another. A Polaroid film is made out of a polymer of polyvinyl alcohol, which looks like this. And it's got some iodine in it usually to make it work better. Now, you, you probably have heard that the uh, sky is blue because light is being scattered by the atmosphere, the sunlight is. Now, if you take a polarizer and it looks, this is a sheet of Polaroid film that I bought from Amazon, costs a dollar or two. And then I put it in these uh, electrical socket covers. All right. If you hold it up to the sky, 90 degrees from the sun. So hold your left arm out towards the sun and then put this out. You'll see you get transmission this way, but not this way. What's going on here is as the light comes in and hits a molecule in the atmosphere, it can vibrate up and down like this and be scattered this way. So you only see the vertical one or it can be vibrate this direction and go up and you'll have that. But nothing can be the polarization of the incoming light wave. There isn't anything in the direction of travel. So you can't get this one. The one other thing that's in the news a little bit late, lately, this scattered light, the blue is scattered the most the higher frequency light is scattered by the atmosphere. So if you wanted to see through the atmosphere, it's easy, you'll be, have better luck if you used a longer wavelength light. And so when people look at the center of our galaxy, they use infrared light to see through all the dust. And you can kind of see an example here. Okay, reflected light is also polarized. And again, it's the same thing. You have incoming light, it's polarized in those two transverse directions. As you get here, this reflected light can't have any polarization in the direction of travel, it has to be transverse. And so that means one of these doesn't work. And so here you have sunlight reflecting off a window. So this vertical polarization is transmitted, but not the horizontal. In, in the days before Polaroid film was available, which would be, I believe, before World War II, this was how you got polarized light. So a microscope in 1860 would have these pieces of reflective glass. Metal doesn't work, it has to, have to be something like glass. And that's how they would get a single polarization to do their mineralogy. So it was a lot trickier. 
<clears throat> you can put polarizers in a series. So here, here's an example, here's a light flashlight. Here's two polarizers and a screen. So this one's vertical, this one's horizontal, vertical, horizontal. What happens if you put two sheets of Polaroid that are oriented in the same direction? It makes it slightly darker, but the light still gets through. If you orient them perpendicular to each other, it becomes black. And then in a kind of very interesting thing, if you put a third one in between, then light goes through again. And that's one of the tricks in cross-polarized light. So to do the experiments I'm going to do, I would move this to the left or the right so that, say, I had the horizontal polarization in front of this vertical. OK. So, so here's the vertical polarizer, horizontal, and the screen and a light source. <clears throat> so I used a uh, light meter to measure the light without any polarizers in front, it would be 643. If I put one polarizer, it's 248. It's cutting it in half, basically. Not a big surprise. If I put a third polarizing sheet angled at 45 degrees, light goes through again. The light intensity is 25. Pretty dramatic. And what's going on here is that the vertical polarization, when it sees this one, you can think of it as it's pushing electrons up an inclined plane by using a vertical or a horizontal force. You can still do it. It's not very efficient. So this is eliminating some light that's polarized this direction. And so the resulting that gets through is going to be at an angle. And so it will get through this last polarizer. Now, if you look over on this screen, which I can't see that well, but I put a sheet of saran wrap. And saran wrap is clear. Like if you use it in your kitchen, it's very transparent. If you put it between these two polarizers and stretch it with your hands, you will align the polymers in that saran wrap and you'll get these interesting color effects. Normally, the polymers in the saran wrap are oriented randomly. If you, if you used a polymer that had a charge on it, then you could use a voltage to orient them, and you could get a uh, LCD type display, liquid crystal display. OK, so what I wanted to do, though, is take a piece of muscovite mica, because it's naturally thin. It's a natural thin section. So I put a piece of muscovite mica between a horizontal polarizer, a vertical one. And this is what I saw on the screen. Lots of different colors here. If I tilt it, I get this kind of pattern. As you can imagine, I was very happy when I did that. So here's a thin sectioning uh, machine. Mike is the only mineral I found that I could get anything interesting to happen. Most minerals, we have to cut them, like they're doing 20 micrometers. Most people do between 20 and 30 micrometers. And you, that thickness, that's like 50 wavelengths of visible light. So it's very thin. So they take a block of a rock that you're interested in, cut it, glue it to a slide, and then they have a way of grinding it down smoothly to that thickness. And uh, of course, I don't know how to do that. Um, the price to get somebody else to do it is 20 to $200. So for example, that first slide I showed where they did a hundred thin, over a hundred thin sections, that if they paid someone else to do it, use up their whole budget. So that I'm sure they had access to a machine there at the Thermopolis Dinosaur Center or, or at a geology uh, lab at the university. So they make their thin sections. So it's a, a craft thing. It's not something I did in my garage. Okay, so now if you take a thin section, this is an example of quartzite. And you can see again, there's black, gray, white, these are all quartz crystals, some other things in there occasionally, but it's mainly quartz. 
The difference is their orientation. It's like the, when I put that 45 degree polarizer between the vertical and the horizontal, some light gets through. So these, this quartz crystal right here is oriented roughly 45. This one is either vertical or horizontal. This quartz crystal, it's not at 45, but it's at an angle, so a little bit of light gets through. And one of the things you can see right away is you get much higher resolution. You can see the boundaries, the edges, and, and people that are doing economic geology, they really care about what's going on in between things. What, what is it, what's the story there? In a quartzite, of course, there's not a whole lot to look at in between because they're right next to each other. This is a schist, quartz biotite muscovite schist. In, a schist would be a metamorphic rock. Like I see them at South Pass. There's probably lots of them in the Tetons. It's not a common thing for me to, that I've seen, but I, I don't get through that much in the Tetons. But you have this, sh this schist. Here's the quartz right here. Gray, white, black. So it sticks out. Here's some biotite which is like muscovite only has iron in it and iron absorbs light. Here's some muscovite, some fancy colors. So right away, even an amateur is starting to see that some of the structure of the mineral by looking at this. And also you can see it's laminated. Maybe that's not the right word, but it's, it's got a directional part to it. A schist does that. Okay, this is a peridotite from Oman. So this would be like a mantle rock. And here's the plain polarized light. Here's the cross polarized light. So most of this is olivine, I believe. Different colors. And so if it's the same mineral and has different colors, I have to wonder why that is. Here's another picture of an olivine from Yellowstone Park. So in the lavas up there, there's a lot of olivine in the lava. Brandy Lowler at the University of Wyoming took this thin section. All three of these things are olivine and they all have dramatically different colors. So what is the, what's going on there, all right? Can't be just angle, <clears throat> at least I don't think. Okay, so what's causing the coloration of those cross-polarized images? So if we look at the light hitting the mineral and we decompose it into two polarizations, a vertical and a horizontal, and it's kind of arbitrary what coordinate system we use. You just pick one that's convenient. And now imagine this light hitting this mica crystal right here. So you can see this crystal is not symmetrical. There's sheets and sheets here. So light that came in vertically like this, is going to see something very different than light that horizontal, parallel to the sheet. So the different speeds, meaning, and that's birefringence, these, these two phases, these two uh, polarizations are going to move at different speeds through this microcrystal. So they'll have two different indexes of refraction and that's birefringence. And since these two polarizations become out of phase, one way to describe it is to say they're circularly polarized. This is the trick in this cross polarized thing. And I have to tell you, it took me a couple of days of thinking about this to get it. So the idea that you're just gonna get it in one minute on the slide, um, at least it took me a long time. So you can imagine the thin section increasing thickness like this. So imagine 25 micrometers right here. <clears throat> and imagine this is a light as it's going through, you'll see it transmit if the vector of the polarization is that a 45 or 135, just like that sheet I put in, like down here. Oops. 
So you have to get your pole, the, the sum of those two vectors that are rotating. It has to be 45 to get transmitted. And each color of light moves at a different speed. So each, sorry, my, I'm moving this with my mouse. It's hitting so. Okay, so each color of light moves at a different speed through the crystal. So they're all circularly polarized. They're all moving at a little different speed. So at one precise depth, a different color will be enhanced. So there's two effects going on here. The wavelength of the light and the depth. So you, you can see this in this chart. So over here, I have thickness of the thin section. So maybe 30 micrometers. And down here is the birefringence. And the way you get the birefringence number is you look at the index of refraction in the two different directions and take the difference. So for example, quartz, which is not very birefringent, the index of refraction is almost the same. So it's about 0 0.01. So it's over here. And if you go to 30 micrometers, you're gonna get whites and grays. It's not very colorful. If you make your thin section thicker, you'll get some yellow. So that, and that's what we saw in those thin sections. The quartz was generally black, white, and gray. If you do calcite, the index of refraction varies quite a bit from the different directions. So the difference is roughly 0.1. So it's way over here. So calcite, like here's a sample of quartz right there. Calcite is over here. So it's, these colors here are called pastel colors according to geologists. And pastel means you're actually getting more than one, one wavelength through. So the different colors combine and you get that. If you take something intermediate like muscovite, muscovite has three indexes of refraction. And if you took the difference between a couple of them, you, for example, these first two, the difference would be 0 0.03. And you go up to a 30 micrometer thick thin section, then slight differences in thickness of the crystal will give this. So what was going on in those olivine crystals that we saw, which had a big difference in index of refraction, is even though the thin section might all be 30 micrometers thick, the crystal inside the thin section is not exactly 30. It could have small variations. And a variation of just a couple micrometers changes it from yellow to purple, right? Here's an example of that. This is a shocked quartz from Haiti. David Kring looks at, he's an expert on asteroid strikes. And he is, he's published a huge amount of stuff on these things. And he went and got some samples from Haiti to, to look at shocked quartz from the Chicxulub uh, impact in Mexico. And these aren't thin sections, they're not polished, they're small on that same scale, but they're, they're grains of quartz. The, the shocked part is these lines here. And the reason he's interested in them is this shocked quartz, it comes from an impact. Uh, I haven't found uh, uh, another reason for that. So one of the things that, one of the evidences for an impact is shocked quartz. There's a couple of other interesting minerals too. But if you look at a piece of a regular quartz crystal, which you put next to it for comparison, as these colors are changing as you go across here, what's going on is you remember quartz, it's about 0 0.01. As you go up in height, the color that transmitted is going to be different. So you're going increasing height and then decreasing again. So you're going up and down and you'll see that color pattern. So there's two things in the colors that you see in the thin section, the thickness and the birefringence. Here's a piece of dolomite, plain polarized light, cross polarized light. So <clears throat> you can see the carbonates are very colorful because of the high birefringence. So you can see if you were looking at these thin sections for a couple of weeks, pretty soon you would put the thin section under the microscope and know exactly what you were looking at, especially if you could rotate it.
Here's a nice, I, <clears throat> this is not from the Tetons, it's from uh, Manitoba. One of the problems with the thin sections, say from South Pass or the Tetons, is that many of these were taken, you know, 50, 60 years ago, and they're sitting in a storage container somewhere. There's no, no images. So, you know, you'd have to go get them and put your modern microscope on and take the photo. So I don't have good uh, thin sections of the Tetons. But if you look at this uh, nice, like here's a plagioclase, and you can see the twinning. In fact, two kinds of twinning. It's pretty interesting. Here's quartz. Plagioclase has the, roughly the same kind of birefringence as quartz. So it's not very colorful. But because of the twinning, it's still very distinctive. So here's a piece of quartz oriented the wrong way to transmit light. Here's an amphibole horn blend. Biotite. Now, if an expert geologist can probably determine things just by looking at these crystals. I can. I read about it, but I, I'm not competent enough to tell you anything. Here's a one of a granite. And this is a little different granite probably than what you'd see in the Tetons. But it illustrates one thing. There's some minerals that don't transmit light, even in a thin section. Sulfides and oxides, like magnetite, they're black. But here you can see chlorite, epidote. <clears throat> I go to South Pass a lot, so I, of course, wanted to see some thin sections of South Pass. The only two images I could find this is of a meta andesite and a meta gabbro, and they're not very interesting because there was zero documentation on it because somebody had sold them on eBay. E evidently, older thin sections are something people collect. You know, and they've been made for 100 years, so you can find some very old ones. Okay, a couple of incidental effects on the thin sections. One is relief which you can see on the thin section, but I'm showing a more dramatic example. So if the mounting media has an index of refraction of, in this case, 1.54, and your mineral has a different index of refraction, then light is going to refract when it goes from one to the other. So here quartz has the same index of refraction. You can't even see the edge. But garnet, which has a big difference, the light that's coming in here is refracted. So there'll be dark and light spots. And you can see this in this diagram. As light comes up, if it hits something that's lower in index of refraction, it'll be refracted this way. If it's higher, it'll be refracted this way. So you get dark and light lines. And this can help people on those thin sections identifying a mineral. So they'll, they can rotate the slide, they can look at the the uh, relief, they can look at the colors, lots of clues in there. Okay, last effect, last slide, is the conoscopic effect. This was one of the things that was very common 100 years ago because they would use this to identify minerals when they didn't have the luxury of X-ray diffraction or uh, X-ray fluorescence. They use this conoscopic effect, which of course is quite striking. They put, between the polarizer and the sample, they put a lens called the condenser. And it's gotta be a fairly curved lens to make the light all intersect on the mineral. Then another curved lens, the objective in the microscope. And, and what's going on in this image kind of illustrates everything I've been talking about previously. So you can imagine the, as the light goes through the mineral this way, it's going on a longer path length than going vertically up the center. And uh, so it's thicker. The sample's thicker on that line. So you get some pastel colors out here, where in here you get the more, more uh, restricted colors. The polarization direction is also changing. And so you get in these two lines, one would be lines that are parallel with the analyzer, 
The other one is parallel to the polarizer. And so you get darkness there. Now, the reason they liked doing this 100 years ago is some minerals get this pattern, some minerals get this pattern, depending on how many optical axes they have, how many index of refraction, like this one would have three, this one two. And so experts could, could do this. Uh, where I first saw this was the rocks that were collected by the Hayden expedition in the 1870s were taken back to Washington and they invited somebody from Germany to come and show them how to identify things on there. And that's how he would do it. So, and, and of course they didn't have cameras to take a picture of it. They had an illustrator draw colored uh, photos of it, very high quality ones. Okay, that's the end. Uh, I wanna recommend Les Cowley. His atmospheric optics page has all kinds of things besides halos, very interesting. And the guidebook I use to help me through this is Feynman Lectures of Physics. This is a, an interesting book. This guy Feynman, he was good at teaching electricity. So he taught the freshman physics class at Caltech in 1962. These two professors, Lighten and Sands, used a camera and a tape recorder and recorded everything that happened in the classroom. And they transcribed it into a book. It's a fairly large book and kind of unwieldy. It's in three volumes. So Caltech put it on the web where it's much easier to use. It's freely available to everyone. And it's, it's a very popular book. This is the first time I used it for this talk, but I found it very helpful. Okay, that's it. Uh, <clears throat> this is Mike Schur. Uh, John, I wanna thank you for a very high level talk. Uh, I may need some tutoring on, uh, <laughs> on some of the finer aspects. Uh, before I get to the questions, I want to, uh, <clears throat> we do have two openings for the New Mexico field trip. Uh, I was able to confirm that. So if you'd like to go on that trip, which will be a terrific trip, it's uh, run by Dr. Geisman, who is incredibly knowledgeable. Uh, like a geologist's geologist, uh, please contact John Willott and uh, we can put you on if, uh, if you're interested. So a couple of questions. Uh, and I, I think you answered this, but I'm gonna, I'm gonna ask it because I missed the, the answer, but you talked about the deflection being 22 degrees. Yes. Why, why 22 degrees? Okay. Okay, 22 degrees comes from the ice crystals are hexagonal. If ice crystals were square or triangles, the deflection would be different. So to understand it, all you have to do is look at one side of the crystal because when the crystal rotates to the next side, it's just going to do the same thing again, right? So we just have to look at light in intersecting it at different points on one side. And using the index of refraction, you can calculate what it's going to do right there, and you get 29 degrees. Same thing, now imagine rotating the crystal a little further, 22. And then at this point, it's 33. Now, if you rotated the crystal further to right there, well, that's just this point again, so you're at 29. So it's not exactly 22, but it's in that range. And if you had, different shaped crystals, you would get a different kind of halo. And if the crystal was made out of something with a different kind of index of refraction, for example, if the crystals were carbon dioxide on, for example, Mars, then you would get different possibilities. Okay. Uh, if you go to his webpage, he actually has simulations set up where you can rotate it and see this. Uh, how thin is a thin section? 20 to 30 micrometers. And the way I think about it, 
um, is that it's roughly 50 wavelengths of light. That's, that's the key to making a good, to getting these good effects, you have to make it thin enough so that there's not a lot of wavelengths of light going through. Otherwise, everything's going to show up. So like in relation to a piece of paper, for example, uh, you know, something um, that we have in our ordinary life, since I, I've not held a thin see. section in my hand. Is... Like the thinness on garbage bags, I think in the grocery store, they say they're three or four mils, which is a millionth of a meter. So roughly that thickness. Okay. That would be a micrometer. Uh, you, you mentioned twinning. Uh, <clears throat> what is twinning and, and what causes it? Okay. Um, that's getting a little beyond what I understand. But twinning is when, as the crystal is forming, you don't necessarily have just one crystal. You have lots of crystals forming and they intersect and combine. And plagioclase, for reasons I don't know, twins more than say orthoclase. So it's diagnostic, but that's the limit of my knowledge. Uh, you talked about how you could make thin sections yourself with mica. Why is that or how is that? Because the mica flakes off. It, in other words, I'm not really making it. I'm just peeling off a piece of the mica with the tweezers. Um, but I can't, I, there's no other minerals that do it. I was just fortunate in that there's one interesting mineral that comes in flakes <laughs> because it's a sheet silicate would be the chemistry explanation. And, and as I understand it, the bonds are arranged sort of like a piece of paper. They they go in one plane, but not in 90 degrees. Exactly, like and, graphite. Yeah, okay. It's a silicate version of graphite. Uh, and so I know you explained this, but I personally missed it. Can you give a very quick explanation of uh, the, the cross-polarized versus not cross-polarized? Um. Yes. Okay. Polarized. Let's say I took this piece out. I just had this one. Then I have polarized light. I could either, it would either be vertical or if I slid it over horizontal. Cross polarized light means I put one of these in and I have it the opposite direction as the one in front of it. So if I push this over, so that this horizontal one is in front of this vertical, then I have cross-polarized light. That's the origin of the name. They're crossed in directions. So, so the lines are basically uh, up and down on the first one, for example, and then side to side on the second one. Exactly. Okay. And that's what those arrows are, because you can't see it by looking at the film. So right. I put arrows on there to help me remember. And so, for example, my old uh, SLR camera, I had a polarizing filter. And when you rotated it, you would change, you, you would eliminate a lot of the reflected light outside. That's right. basically all the lines are either vertical or as you rotate it, they 90 degrees, they become horizontal. Is that? Right. Like the right. reflected light, let's see. Reflected light tends to have one polarization, this one. So if you make your Polaroid filter, your glasses have this, then when you look at the ocean, you're not going to see the reflected light. You'll just see the, the light being emitted by the thing you're looking at. Okay. Uh, let's see. These are kind of, I mean, I have to tell you, these are kind of subtle points and I, it took, you know, I spent a couple months doing this, trying to understand this. It's interesting is why I talked about it, but I'm not saying it's easy. No, 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 we, we, we agree. It's, it, I mean, it, some of these slides, I had to spend a whole day thinking about it to see if it actually made sense to me. Right. No, anything that has to do with physics is never easy. Uh, so last question. So when you look at the thin section, 
at, for example, of the quartzite, and you see the black spots, and then you see the clear spots, the way I understand it is the black spots are absorbing all of the light. Uh, the clear spots are, or, or I'm sorry, the black spots are, are, are they reflecting everything back? And the clear spots are letting all that light through? Okay. Is, that, is the question I clear? I understand the question. In other words, when, when okay. we look at the thin so, section, we're, the, we're the seeing what's being reflected the back. crystals are oriented in different directions, all right? You know, when you make the rock out of a bunch of quartz crystals, they're oriented in random directions. Right. All right? So as the light hits them, <clears throat> the quartz crystal, let's see, that's not the right picture. Or okay, maybe go to the picture one. of the thin section itself. Yeah, okay. So, <clears throat> yes. All these quartz crystals are oriented in different directions. Right. Right. So think of them as a, the polymer, the Polaroid film cut in little pieces oriented in random directions. The ones that are oriented in this 45 are going to transmit the most light, like this one. If it's trans, if this if it's oriented vertically or horizontally, then no light's going to get through. It'll be like this black one. So it's absorbing all the light. It's not reflecting any of it. Right. Most, most people, you know, I don't know the details of what goes, like, if you go back to, if you go back to this wire grid polarizer, you know, one polarization is transmitted, the one that's not transmitted, I don't know the, the molecular details, but what's happening is that polarization is moving electrons up and down in that wire. They're colliding with atoms in the wire and generating heat. So you, it's possible, like if it was a copper wire, maybe it's broadcast light in other directions, but I don't know that. From what I've seen, and working with the polarite film anyway, is it just absorbed in heat. It's not reflected back towards the source or to the uh, scattered to the side. Well, John, I, I think you've actually answered all the questions and I wanna thank you for all the time and energy you put into this talk, which I can tell is, uh, is considerable and uh, it's it's a topic that I will have to spend a little more time on to really understand, I think. Oh, yeah. But uh, I want to thank you for all of us for, for putting this together. And uh, <clears throat> I want to remind everybody in two weeks, uh, we're going to have another excellent talk. Uh, Tony Hartshorn from Montana State University and about soils and are they really a solution for climate change? But uh, John, thank you very much. Sure. And uh, you put in a lot of information in a, in a very short time. So we appreciate it. Thank you and uh, good night everyone. And we'll see you in, in two weeks and hopefully we'll see everyone in person very soon as well. All right, bye. Thanks, John. Yeah. That was really good. I really liked the way you went back to first principles and uh, tried to explain everything with the practical, you know, ex ex experiments and things that was very brought back memories. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. All right. Um, have a well, great thanks. evening. Thanks. Yep. Thanks a lot. Yep. Thanks right. for everything. Thanks, everyone. John. Bye bye. Okay, I guess. I guess at this point, I will uh, end the meeting for everybody here. Yep. That's correct, okay. Mike. Thank you. Okay. All right. Sure enough. So, so much for this. Good night. Good night, all.